Amen. How many know God's good this morning? And uh, merciful towards us. I want us to turn to the book of Luke in chapter 23 and verse 14. And we're going to read down, uh, missing some verses, down to verse 33. Just as you're turning there, on the 20th of December, 1943, uh, there was a German um, fighter pilot, Hans Stigler, uh, who was about to shoot down a, an American bomber and, uh, that was flying back towards England. And as he kind of began to close in, he had his finger on the trigger, and uh, just as he was about to begin to squeeze the trigger, uh, he notices that there's no return fire, no one's shooting him or trying to... Uh, resist him, and so he lets his finger off the trigger and he takes a bit of a closer look and he notices that the gunner on the aeroplane is dead and uh, that others that are there have been wounded. And so he uh, decides to do the honourable thing and he signalled to the American pilot uh, that, you know, he wasn't going to, I don't know how he signalled, but he signalled in such a way that he knew he wasn't going to attack him. But then the, 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 the German fighter pilot flew with the bomber uh, back into uh, to the channel and then left him and let the American bomber go back and uh, basically saved the crew. But it was interesting, after the war, the, the uh, good name for an American, Charlie Brown, but his name was Charles Brown, the American pilot, and he searched for 50 years to try and find Hans Stigler to, to say thank you and for what he'd done. And he eventually found him. They became best of friends. And to show his thanks, he, he had a, a big dinner. And uh, in the dinner, he had, a, he, he had a, a screen up. And he had all the, 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 the men that had been on his plane. They had their pictures of their grandkids and great-grandkids or whatever that were there. Uh, and so the, the aim of it, they had Hans Stigler come to the dinner. They made him the guest of honor. And they wanted to show him what his... Uh, I guess his decision, or his choice had produced. There's all these grandkids and people that would never have existed if it hadn't been for his decision. And it made me think about Christ and how we honour him for what he's done for us. I just want to read our text, Luke 23, and there's one thing that really gives God honour, and we want to consider that for a few moments today. Luke 23, 14. So, so then, uh, so he said to them, you have heard, uh, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I find no fault in this man concerning those things which you accuse him. Uh, no, neither did Herod, and for I've sent him back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been found by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, uh, for it was necessary for him to be released uh, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. And they all cried at once, saying, Away with this man, release us Barabbas, uh, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate therefore wished to release Jesus, uh, called out to them again, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then verse 26 <coughs> says, no they, uh, no, they led him away, and laid hold of a certain man named Simon of uh, a Cyrenian, who was coming from that uh, from the country, and on him they laid the cross uh, that he might bear it after Jesus. And in verse 33, uh, when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right hand, one on his left. Let's pray, Father. We ask your blessing. God, anoint your word today, and we ask that you would cause the Holy Spirit, God, to do what. No person can do, God, we ask you to change hearts, to save those that are unsaved, to bring conviction and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's consider first Christ's cross. We don't always have a very clear picture of who we are. Uh, do you remember the Pharisee? And, uh, you know, it's, he, he goes into the temple, Lord, I thank you, I'm not like other men. And uh, think of David when Nathan uh, confronts him. And, uh, you know, tells him the story about the man who took the, the, the neighbor's uh, sheep and so on. And he's outraged. And he's, he's, he's a, you know, this man needs to die. He couldn't see himself. And in our text, verse 18, it said they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, or release us Barabbas, 
who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion <coughs> in the city and for murder. I mean, we see Barabbas as a pretty wicked man. Uh, you know, how many have ever watched the Jesus movies? You know, the G- and Barabbas is always, you know, he's, 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 uh, you know, he's dribbling and he's all, you know, he's, he's, his hair sticking out everywhere. He's always a, you know, nasty looking individual. And it's, it's, so whenever you watch it, it always seems so wrong, you know, as they lead Jesus away. And this absolute scumbag is, uh, you know, released. He's, he's, he's let go. Just seems wrong that he should go free and Christ should die. But it's interesting, when we witness, we often tell people that uh, Jesus took our place on the cross and he died in our place. And uh, we know we're not perfect. You know, we've made mistakes. But we're certainly not like Barabbas. You know, that's it. Uh, he, he's, he's a, he's, you know, he was, he was completely undeserving. And uh, he was evil. But, you know, verse 19 said he was thrown into prison for a certain rebellion. And how many know that's exactly who we were? In that story, when we read that, uh, we are Barabbas. It... Uh, We lived our lives in rebellion against God. Everything he loved, we trampled underfoot. Uh, James 4.4 said, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. So we weren't just, yeah, you know, I was involved in a little bit of drugs and something like that. We were actually, we made ourselves the enemy of God. We were, we were, and so in a very real sense, we were Barabbas. And yet God loved us and wanted to rescue us. That's the amazing thing, and I still can't get my head around it. Why God would want to do that, a love that was expressed by his ultimate sacrifice, verse 33, when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. 1 Peter 2.24, he personally carried our sins in his own body on the cross. You know, it means so much to Christ to rescue us. He is, he, is, he, is, he, he is absolutely thrilled that he's been able to rescue us. Uh, he tells parables again and again, three in a row. You know, the, the parable of the lost coin. He said, rejoice with me, for I find the peace that was lost, the lost son. Luke 15, 24, for my son was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Uh, the lost sheep, Luke 15, 26 and 7, says when he comes to the home, he calls out to his friends, uh, saying, Rejoice with me, for I find my sheep which was lost. And he said, I tell you, there is likewise more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. You know, it's hard for us to grasp what our salvation means to God. He really is thrilled and absolutely rejoicing and so glad that you got saved. You know, there's a Chinese couple uh, that had a son, Mao Yin. Uh, some of you might have read about him. It was a period of time ago, but he was abducted uh, when he was two years old. And it was in 1988. His father was passing a hotel somewhere in China and uh, thought he'd pop in for a, for a, for a quick drink of water, buy a bottle of water. So he, he, uh, he left his, his uh, son just at the door, raced in, grabbed the water, came back out, the son's gone. And he'd been abducted, and his parents searched the country to try and find him. His mother, I don't know why it highlights his mother, I don't know what the dad was doing, but the mother distributed more than 100,000 leaflets. And there was no trace of him. He was gone. And then last year, uh, 32 years later, uh, through a series of events, he was phoned. And his parents were told on the 10th of May, which was Mother's Day, apparently in China, and his mother said, this is the best gift I've ever got. You know, that's exactly how God feels about us. Hard for us to grasp, because we know who we are, but we are the best gift that God, we're, we're what he wants more than anything. There's joy in heaven over one person, which is astounding. You know, we have an outreach, and it's like, you know, we had, you know, uh, you know 30 visitors, but, but, yeah, only one got saved. That's not how heaven looks at it. Heaven looks at it. They're thrilled. 
heaven rejoices. And in the text, in the middle of Jesus going to the cross and shedding his blood, we read of Simon of Cyrene carrying Christ's cross. Read how he got roped in and, and got to carry it. And that has great significance for us because biblical Christianity involves not only the wonder of the cross of Calvary, but it involves another cross that we are to carry. And uh, we don't just come to the cross, but we're to carry a cross ourselves. So let's look secondly at our cross. Because the Bible says we need to take up our cross and follow Christ. Uh, But firstly, let's look at how Christ took up his cross. It says we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was betrayed. It says in Luke 22, 41, he knelt down, prayed, saying, Father, if it be your will, uh, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but let your will be done. And then the angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Now, three things are very evident when Jesus took up his cross. It wasn't what he naturally wanted to do. And we, he says those words, uh, if it is your will, God, take this away from me. I'm not, I'm not wanting in myself to do this. Uh, it wasn't easy for him, says being in agony. He prayed more earnestly and he got supernatural help from God and an angel appeared and strengthened him. But three things are also true for us if we're going to take up our cross. These, they're, they're the same thing. It's not going to necessarily be what we want to do. I mean, we live in a, in a world where we're not used to doing things we don't want to do. You know, you go into the shopping center, we've got a zillion choices. You know, I go for cereal. or We're, we got, we're, we're given myriads of choices. Uh, our world, everything is made as easy as possible. You know, you don't have to, you just, you don't have, you have to touch your phone. You just talk to it. You know, hey, Siri, you know. Uh, everything is made as, as simple, as smooth, as little trouble. And so... Uh, But taking up our cross, it's not always going to be what necessarily you want to do. And uh, it's not necessarily going to be easy. But one of the things God will do is he'll provide help. I use uh, use the word if because there are a lot of people in Christianity, it's possible to to be saved, uh, but never really take up our cross to follow. It's, it's, uh, you know, we kind of... Uh, I'm a, I spent a long time as a Christian as a part-time cross carrier. You know, I'd kind of <laughs> carry a little bit and <laughs> kind of open the cup, put it in there for a while and then get it back out again. Yeah, it was very, uh, you know, people said, man, it looks like new. Yeah, it hasn't been used very much. It, uh, it's why Paul wrote to the believers in Rome. He said, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Taking up your cross is the only reasonable response in light of what Christ has done. You know, it's unreasonable to do anything else. And on Judgment Day, when we stand before God, it's, we're going to have a full revelation of that. But it, the reality, anything else other than presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice is unreasonable in, in, in light of what he's done for us. In light of the fact he's sacrificed what he's done for us, in light of the fact that he is absolutely thrilled that we're saved, is in light of that, to not take up our cross is, is the script Paul said, is unreasonable. It's like, uh, so let's consider what Christ actually meant when he said in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow It says, if anyone desires to come after me. So in essence, it's impossible to follow Christ without taking up our cross. And there's no exceptions. The Bible shows us why our cross is also so challenging to take up. Because we're triune beings. And, uh, you know, we have a spirit, we have a body, we have a soul. And uh, our spirit is that part of us that connects with God. Our body is obviously the thing we carts us around. But our soul is that part of us that expresses itself through our will, which is what I want, through our intellect, which is what I think, and through our emotions, 
is what I feel. And the behavior of the unsaved world is consumed and controlled by the soul. The world lives by what I want, what I think, and what I feel. It's their soul that, that dominates their decisions, their choices. Their actions are determined by what they want and what they think and what they feel. Like, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? Why are you making that decision? Because I feel it, I want it, and that's what I think. But when we get saved, there needs to be a change. Mark 1, uh, 14 and 15 says, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is, or the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. So two things, we, we, we repent, we put our trust in the blood, God's forgiveness, uh, uh, we believe, but then we repent, which is a change of mind that changes how we live. So a big part of repentance is that we change from living by what I want and what I think and what I feel. It's, it's, really, repentance is just a change of view on lots of different areas, but essentially it changes us from living soulishly by what, this is what I think, this is what I feel, this is what I want, and we begin to say, what does God want and what does God think and how does God feel about this? And really, essentially, that's what it means to take up your cross. It means you go from what I like, what I want, what I feel, what I think. And when we take up our cross, our life begins to be governed by what does God want, what does God think, and how does God feel about this? We really pick up our cross when our will and what we want and think and feel crosses what God wants and thinks and feels. When there's, when there's a clash of interests, that's why I said many times I've just kind of with a clash of interests, oh, I'd slip the cro cross into the cupboard and, 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 and do what I want and then get it out again <laughs> on Sunday morning, dust it down, I was ready for service. But um, the reality is w when we really pick up our cross, it means when what God wants and what we want, when that clashes, what we do then is a great determining factor of whether we really have picked up our cross to follow Christ. Choose to deny and say no to what we want and choose what God wants. We make a decision. Uh, we're no longer going to rebel against God. Because somebody knows it's possible to be saved but still rebellious against God. It, uh, you know, it's possible to have kids that are in your family. They're part of the family. but <laughs> They're not always doing exactly what you want them to do. It, um, and so with God, th that taking up of the cross really is where we choose uh, we choose to die, where we say, you know what, I am going to make a deliberate choice in the daily affairs of my life that I am going to do what God wants me to do. I may not feel like it. I may not at that time want to do it. But the Bible, Jesus said, if anyone comes after me, a lot of times we think, I'm, gonna, I'm praying I get to that place. We just, I, I, I just want to do the will of God all the time. I mean, no, no one gets to that place. As long as we live in these bodies, we'll always have a cross to carry. There's always going to be a time where what we want and what we think and what we feel is going to contradict what God wants. And us yielding to God is when we take up our cross. God won't impose his will upon us. We must take it up freely. I choose to allow God to govern my life today. It's a daily choice. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. It's a deliberate choice today. I am going to do what God wants me to do. Matthew 10, 38, and he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's a profound scripture. This isn't, you know, it's, it, 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 he said, if someone said, I, I, I'm not going to do what God wants, I'm going to do what I feel like doing. The Bible says when we, when we live like that, it's obviously not a, not a, you know, a momentary thing. Or a, but when we have that attitude, it says that, that we're not worthy of him. You know, every time we set aside our will to do God's will, it is incredibly spiritual. It doesn't seem like that. You know, we come into church and you know, we're singing, our hands are lifted. and It's like, oh, man, it feels so good. Feel the presence of God. You know, this is spiritual. And it is. But you know, when you take up your cross, 
you don't feel like that. It's not like, oh, man, this is, oh, oh, I feel good. I don't want to do this at all, but, you know, oh, man, it just feels so good doing it. It's not like that. Taking up your cross, it's, it's like, just like Jesus, it's a wrestling, it's a, but it is deeply spiritual. When you deny yourself, there's nothing more spiritual almost that you can do is when you say, you know what, I know what God wants me to do. I'm going to leave what I feel like and I'm going to do what he wants. I tell you, you're never more spiritual. That's more deeply spiritual than any praise and worship, than any is, is, is when we set us up, when we lay down our lives to do what he wants. So let's close. I want to look at beyond the cross. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Beyond the cross was incredible blessing for the Lord. He said he, he, the Bible said he endured it because of what lay on the other side. <coughs> the same is true for every one of us when we're willing to take up our cross is uh, when we do, our life's not going to remain the same. If we really do take those words of taking up our cross daily, because when we take, take up our cross, God sees. Somebody says something to you and you're ready to <laughs> prophesy. It, uh, <laughs> and you catch yourself and you go, you know what, you know what? that is unrighteous. <laughs> Everything in me wants to bring a word. But I, ref I, I am not going to do that. I'm simply going to say nothing and let it pass. And no one else sees that. No one knows that. People probably just think, oh, I had nothing to say. But you know, and God sees, and God knows, and God watches. Perhaps he has seen you like Jesus in the garden. You know, they, you're going to say, oh, well, he was with his disciples. Well, they were sleeping. So no one was really watching. He's there by himself. And the same is true with us. Sometimes you're wrestling. To do the will of God is not always easy. And like I said, it's, that's why there's a cross we have to carry. But I tell you, God watches all the time. Taking up your cross is, is life-changing because of how God responds. I want to look at this, John 14, 21. It said, he who has my commands and keeps them. So it's, it's, that's the person who carries the cross. He that has God's commands and in spite of how they feel or what they want or what they think, they, they, they obey God. It's, it said, it's he who loves me. It's that person who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved to my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. It's really strange. We, th you know, we sing a song. We think, oh, man, I just want to let God know how much I love him. You know, sometimes when you just, you just keep your mouth closed, you're actually saying to God, I love you. Right. You know, when there's something that you think, man, I'll just have a look at this on the internet, you feel that twang of conviction. You say, you know what, no. You turn it off. What you're saying is, God, I love you. So he said, those who, who obey me love me. And he said, I'll manifest myself to him. Manifest is the Greek, it means to reveal or to speak to. Adam Clark says he will manifest his power and his goodness. Warren Wearsby said, salvation, it's a great quote, he said, salvation means we're going to heaven, but submission, which is all to do with taking up your cross, means heaven comes to us. There's a lot of people who are waiting for heaven, but if we'll take up our cross, there's something of heaven that comes to us. And when we take up our cross, there's a dimension of relationship that cannot be entered into in any other way. Uh, there's, a d there's a depth of relationship that you can't, even, you can't get it from prayer. You can't get it from Bible reading. You can't get it from praising God. It only comes when you deny yourself and take up your cross. There's something happens between you and God when we really commit ourselves to carry our cross each day. Think of Abraham. James 2.23, it said, Abraham was called the friend of God. But, you know, you, you, that, that wouldn't be said if when God spoke to Abraham to leave her of the Chaldees, if he had simply said no. You wouldn't read that he was the friend of God. If he had, uh, with, you know, what made him God's friend 
is he was willing to carry a cross. He was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. And it's when we take up the cross, put God ahead of what we want, our relationship with God becomes deeper and deeper. It's like I used to wonder sometimes, Pastor Mitchell, it's like you know, he's got this relationship with God, going through everything. But a huge part of that is he lived a life putting what God wanted first. And when Christ manifests himself to us, it brings, it brings a real change in our life. You know, if you think of, just as we close, a couple of scriptures, if you think of Joseph, uh, Genesis 39, 3, the Lord was with Joseph. So that's what the idea of manifesting myself. Uh, it said, and all he did to prosper. It's why God said, uh, well, why Moses said to God, Gen- Exodus thirty-three fifteen, 15, if you yourself are not going with us, uh, don't send us up there. Is that God being with us, that that I'm going to manifest myself to these people that are willing to take up their cross, is that it it talks about a dimension of God's presence that changes life. When Christ manifests himself, life circumstances can change. Uh, Psalm 97.5, the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. It says when we take up our cross, God says, I'm I'm, I'm I'm going to to visit, I'm going to show myself, I'm going to manifest my power to that person. And like I said, in his presence, mountains, things that we think, oh, how could we ever get this thing sorted out, just begin to change. When Christ manifests himself, it changes the atmosphere you live in. Psalm 1611, in your presence is the fullness of joy. Your right hand are pleasures forevermore. All of these things lie beyond the cross. Have you ever not taken up your cross? You've done exactly what you wanted to do. I mean, no, there's not much joy on the other side. You just feel frustrated, miserable, there's conflict, there's issues. But, you know, when you take up your cross, this is what happened. Is that you, you, you do the will of God. There's such a joy on the other side. I tell you, when you, if you, you and I will endure bearing our cross at those different times when God's will and our will clash. I tell you, that, that beyond that, when you make a choice to carry your cross, I tell you, there's such a, such a blessing that lies beyond. God says in 1 Samuel 2.30, and I close, he said, those who honor me, he said, I will honor. And we, ne- we never honor God more than when we take up our cross to follow him. When God says, when I see someone honor me, he said, I'm going to honor them. I mean, no, it's one thing to get the honor of man. You know, somebody says, I want to give you this award. Or I want you to, you know, you see them on the Oscars. You know, they're all there holding up their little Oscar, you know, <laughs> all applauding each other. And... Uh, but, you know, man's reward, you know, the, the, it can be nice to get some sort of a reward or honor. But it is, it's, 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 it's nothing. It's, it's, it's rubbish compared to having God honor you. That God in heaven goes, you know what? That sister right there, I'm going to honor her. I tell you, it's, it'll change your life. You know, carrying our cross isn't an irritant.